Hello, Rebecca. Thank you so much for being here. I'm really happy to speak to you today about your healing story. It's exciting. <laughs> oh, Lena, I love speaking with you across the pond. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I want to begin with is, of course, your story and how everything began because you were a successful TV news reporter. So can you tell us what happened in your life and how it began? Absolutely, yes. I was a TV news reporter, so I lived a very fast-paced life, and I was in San Francisco and then moved to San Diego. Now when I look back, I see how there was a lot of personality traits at play where I was perfectionistic, I was hard driving, but I was still very healthy and, and life was good. I was in my early 30s. And... Um, Then I experienced a really traumatic event, and it was, it was actually a sexual assault um, when I was abroad. And after that point, I became really, really exhausted, and it led to such a state of deep fatigue that I could hardly walk around the house. I could just sort of go from room to room. I certainly could not go back to my job as a TV news reporter. I had caught a few viruses, And my system really crashed, and I was getting all these post-viral symptoms. Um, it felt like I had the flu 24-7, so there was lots of body pains, oh. um, brain fog, digestive issues, insomnia. And as someone who had always been healthy and lived this very active life, it was just a complete shock. And it, it, was, it was really terrifying at the time. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah, I can imagine. Lots of symptoms, and before that, you didn't have any, right? I didn't. I mean, now when I look back at my life, as a lot of us with these mind-body symptoms may notice, you know, I had back pain when I was in my 20s, and it sort of disappeared when I got out of a bad relationship. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> oh. I never really connected, but now, <laughs> of course, you do. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, And when I was going through stress through my job, sometimes I'd get a little bit tired. But otherwise, I was very vital. I mean, I worked 50 hours a week. Um, yeah, and, and worked out and was physically active. So no, I didn't have any of these symptoms before. Mm, yeah, but it's funny because in a way, when you have uh, like TMS or mind body uh, syndrome, you end up having lots of symptoms, you know? Yes. Over and over yes. and over. It's never ending. Absolutely. Well, that's it. And a lot of people will think back to, oh, and I know you've had, you know, knee pain and back pain and it, it jumps around the body. And, and I had gone through a period of headaches. And so these are all related to stress. And until we kind of address, first of all, realize this is related to emotional stress and understand the knowledge and, and sometimes really address ourselves as emotional beings, um, it, it can jump around. And then when you go through a period of heightened stress, so in my case, it was, it was a, a major capital T trauma. Of course. Um, and I do hear from a lot of women that I work with with chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, that they also had sexual trauma. Yeah. But it can be any kind of stressors. You know, it can just be work-related stressors. It could be Um, COVID, or it could be a car accident that triggers stress and these kind of unresolved emotions beneath the surface and really send our brain and nervous system into this hypervigilant state. Yeah, exactly. It's like we are vulnerable at a certain moment and boom, like a little thing. Sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's big. And how oh, up a volcano, you know, deep down and you explode, <laughs> you expose. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And, and I think of it actually as a glass of water. Like, you know, these stressors are kind of building up and building up and then something happens and it starts spilling over the rim. And we think, what happened? I was healthy before, but there were stressors often kind of piling up. And then we get all these symptoms. And unfortunately, very few doctors are trained in this mind-body approach. And so they diagnose us with things that are often very scary. Um, so I was diagnosed pretty early on with MECFS, chronic fatigue syndrome, also fibromyalgia, Epstein-Barr syndrome, Um, and a number of other things. Then they kind of go into candida overgrowth and, yeah, you know, classic. adrenal exhaustion. <laughs> All these things. Yeah, yeah. You've, heard of, you've heard of them too. Yeah. And so it becomes so scary and you start chasing after those symptoms. And, and that's what I did for the better part of a decade. 
um, is really chase after these physical symptoms. Now, I tried to go back to my job as a TV news reporter, and I couldn't. I, I would last at most an hour, and I was just, I had crushing fatigue and dizziness and all kinds of things. So I went to neurologists, rheumatologists, endocrinologists, every kind of specialist, integrative medicine doctors that also had a more holistic approach. Um, and, and then, of course, you know, acupuncturists and energy healers and everybody under the sun. Was it, on, uh, you know, often, uh, it's often the often first part, you just go to like the traditional medicine, like the, the occidental medicine, allopathic medicine, and then you open yourself to new strategies because you're kind of desperate, you know, like acupuncture, <laughs> magnetism and uh, Reiki and everything, you know, I don't know if that's um, what you did. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, when you're so sick like that, I mean, I thought this has to be a disease. You just, I can't go from being this active TV news reporter to hardly being able to leave my house overnight. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, and it is important to get checked out by allopathic medicine doctors when you have symptoms because you want to make sure it isn't something that's treatable. Yeah, exactly. Now, of course, ME CFS is a real diagnosis with real symptoms, but it's a name for a collective collection of symptoms that even the doctors themselves say they don't exactly understand what causes it. Yeah, exactly. And they did tell me, um, well, we think these viruses are just overtaxing your system. And, and I remember one said it got into your brain, it crossed the blood brain barrier. And I was so afraid after that. Of course. I, I, could, I could feel the, the viruses swimming around my brain. I mean, that's what our brains will do when we're given this information. Um, and, you know, they would sometimes say it has something to do with the faulty mitochondria or, or genetic defects. And, and these are things I'm hearing a lot of people with long COVID being told right now. You know, the viruses are still active in your system. So I went down that path for over a decade and I tried first the antiviral medications and those completely crashed my system. I was back in bed for months. So it, it Lots was worse much worse because you know those anti those medications which are really strong given intravenously were were treating something that wasn't the cause i mean essentially i was traumatized and really what i had crosses over very much with ptsd and there's one um physician in this field dr howard schubner that will call fibromyalgia PTSD for the body, because it's these reoccurring symptoms that are happening because of a stress response in the brain and the body. So all those things that were treating the viruses did make it worse. Yeah. Um, for one thing, they scared me further, but of they're course. also strong medications, you know, and in, in my, I was already quite sensitive, mm. but I did all the supplements. I mean, I was on 30, 40 supplements at one point. All the diets, you know, the anti-candida diet, no sugars, no starches. No life. No, no more soups. life, no actually. Life. Yeah. No pleasure. No pleasure. And, and, yeah, exactly. No pleasure at all. Yeah, but you want, it's, okay. it's funny because it's like, there are like three phases. Like one, the first phase is like you, you know, you know, you work a lot because it's uh, you, you, it's your education system that show how much you can, you have to work to have a house, to uh, to get married, to do, you know, what is normal considered as normal. And then the second step, you know, often you have a problem, which led to uh, maybe be more open to find solution, but you are still on, on the control. You you really are trying to get better and to you know to do more. So you are still exhausting your 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 body in a way. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Exactly. Because when we apply this same approach of sort of no pain, no gain, and just pushing ourselves to heal, it backfires because that's part of what fed into the symptoms. Now, with different people, it's, it's different degrees. Some people I see their personality traits like self-criticism and self-pressure are the primary cause of their back pain or knee pain or chronic fatigue. Yeah. You know, in my case, it was, it was a major trauma that I believe was the primary cause. So I did need to really work with that in the body. Um, but yes, I was just a consummate perfectionist, still am recovering from that. And so I remember saying, 
you know, I'm going to heal on a deadline so I can keep my job and get back to my old life. And I was trying to apply the same journalistic deadlines to, to healing the body. And that just puts more internal pressure, mm. which scares our limbic brain and amygdala more <laughs> and ramps up the symptoms. Vicious cycle. And don't get me wrong. I was, of course, I was like that. I saw so many sp specialists and nobody has an answer. I was hospitalized and nobody has an answer, you know. So, so it was really complicated and I'm, I'm thinking about your job so I'm sure that you loved your job so how did you leave the fact to not be able to do that anymore you know yeah it I did love my job I knew I wanted to be a journalist from the time I was in sixth grade <laughs> and I moved around the country in that career and then just going every day hardly being able to take care of myself I mean I was single and I could do basic care but that was it yeah. and then I would spend my other um, waking hours you know fighting health insurance claims and trying to keep my house which was going into foreclosure and yeah. it was so I couldn't believe what my life had become and I think The hardest part of it was just not having meaning or purpose anymore. Yeah. I mean, my purpose became healing, but it really just felt kind of hopeless when I was focusing on the physical cause and trying to cure that. Um, so that really drained a lot of energy with me. And, and I see that with fatigue often is that, you know, we want to increase things that give us life and liveliness and passion and meaning. And when we take those away and then we add, you know, all these scary diagnoses and um, routines like health, strict health regimens on top of it, it really drains the life force out of you. And so the key to turning around chronic fatigue and chronic pain as well and these other symptoms, I think, is really returning to what you love as you're able to. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because it, rem it reminds me of a book which is called Play. Uh, I don't know the author, but uh, it was it was somebody who I think was quite successful. Uh, he was working a lot. And so he, he, dealt, he dealt with big anxiety. It was really difficult. And he just forgot how to play and just not be, you know, uh, I got to do this because I want this to achieve this, you know, and I want this special outcome. And then he, he just, yeah, I think he, get back, he got back to the present moment of being connected to himself, to what he wanted to do and just little simple things. And I think he, 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 he helped a lot, you know, with that. So I understand what you say also to find some light stuff. And because when you are a, a victim in a way, when you are uh, suffering, you want to get out of this state. But in a way, you, you are so serious all the time. You are so focused on healing and you forgot you forget how to live, you know. Oh, absolutely. That is such a key point. And, and I love the title of that book. There's people who have healed. I think it was Norman Cousins that healed through laughter. And he actually had yeah. something really major, I believe, cancer. Um, and he would just watch funny movies yeah, exactly. all day. Yeah, exactly. Remember, I love yes. that concept. <laughs> yes. yes. But we don't love lots, actually. That. And it's, it's so important, yeah, to laugh, to play, to bring in lightness. And we think that that healing is a lot harder than it is. But it makes sense because, you know, when our system is in that sympathetic nervous system activation or even in, in shutdown, what yeah. we call freeze or shutdown, um, it is perceiving a lot of danger. But what can counter that is lightness play. And in my case, I really couldn't do a lot of physical activity. I used to hike miles and miles and I could just sort of go outside and look at the leaves and the birds. But I started noticing over the years, the only thing that really helped was things I enjoyed that were just simple activities like gentle yoga, meditation, being in nature. I started um, reading poetry and, and more spiritual books like Eckhart Tolle and listening to the sound of his voice. Yeah, and then I, I started know. writing poetry. Yeah, and it was so healing. And, and I just noticed, wow, I'll get little boosts, definitely of mental and emotional relief, but even physical relief too. And none of the physical interventions were, were giving me that. So after some point, and yeah, I'm a bit of a slow learner. <laughs> <laughs> I took a number of years, but I just started focusing on 
those things, the things that brought lightness and a little bit of peace and a little bit of relief, and also that took my mind off the symptoms. So that's exactly. why some of the books and writing poetry was really helpful because it gave my you know, busy mind something to do. Yeah, yeah, of course. And when you're suffering, I, I know when I was doing any movement, uh, I was in pain, you know, so I couldn't cook, I couldn't go to the groceries, I couldn't take the metro, I couldn't do anything uh, apart from working for me because I was working on the computer. I had to work because if I stopped working, I didn't have any anything else, you know. So for me, that was important. But yeah, you f you are so serious, and you forget how to do some simple things, some intuitive things. And uh, I just before we are talking about some kind of solutions, I w just want to know if any uh, like uh, allopathic specialist made a difference at all or not really. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when I look back, there was one doctor I saw. And he did ask me a little bit about the psychological stress because none of the other doctors ever asked, well, by the way, you went from being, you know, this perfectly capable young woman to being pretty much homebound and what we consider disabled. You know, what happened psychologically in exactly. your life? Right? Like they didn't ask that. But this this one did. He, he at least sort of opened up the conversation and, and I told him a little bit about the trauma And he said to me, he said, you know what, I know you're coming to me because you want these tinctures. So he was a little more naturopathic mm -hmm. and he did herbal tinctures. He said, but I have a feeling if I give you those, it's going to reinforce your disempowerment that yet another person is telling you what to do with your body. And I think that is part of the root of your symptoms, mm -hmm. that actually you didn't have agency over your body because you lose that when you, when you go through sexual assault. Yeah. And so um, he was very wise and I actually just started sobbing in that appointment and I said, thank you for seeing me. And a light bulb went off there. Um, and, you know, I did start seeing some different psychotherapists and, and some trauma therapy and that was helpful. Um, but it didn't shift the symptoms. And the reason I don't think it did is because none of those therapists were trained in this mind-body approach John yeah. Sarno calls Neither in French. <laughs> myositis syndrome. Okay, yeah. Or Howard Schubner calls mind-body syndrome. And um, they never really said, well, you know, this kind of psychological stress and trauma can actually cause your symptoms. So it just sort of seemed like they were two separate things. And I didn't connect them for a while. Yeah. But it's funny in our life because you need to click to have some, you know, to click. I don't know if, you, if it's the right term in English, but to have some insight like, oh, okay, you say that. And it, it did something to my mind. I, I, understand so, I understood something, you know. And it's yeah. funny how life works with that because it's like you are changing your awareness in a way, you know, like in, the sub, in a subconscious way, you know. <laughs> you really are. And, and I love that word click because something kind of goes off in your, in your brain. Yeah. And I think it, it, it can kind of ignite a truth that we know inside. So when he said that to me, that physician said, you know, I don't want to tell you what to do with your body. You've already been told that, not only in the first trauma, but for years with all these other doctors telling you, take this medication, take this supplement, do this, and just treating you like you're an object. And so something did click for me, and it did sort of open an aha. Mm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I love that. And yeah, it's true that a major point for recovery is understanding that the power comes from within. It's so true. I also had a, a sudden shift in my brain because I was so tired of giving my power to specialists. And at one point, I could not repeat that vicious cycle anymore. I had to get, get in, you know, get in what's going on inside of me, you know. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. When that shift starts happening, I really see changes in people internally, and then the, the symptoms are going to fall away eventually. I think that is so important to take back our power, yeah. because even though doctors are very well intended, and we, we need physicians and medical experts when we have a physical illness with a physical cause, um, but it can be really disempowering, and so we need to reclaim, like, I am... I am living in my body 24-7, not these doctors. I know what diet's best for me. Exactly. And really reclaim that, I think also that gut instinct, which guides us to the right people and the right circumstances when we listen to it. Yeah, 
Exactly. It's so important. And like you said before, having some trauma or some problems uh, in health, you are often so disconnected from your body, from your intuition, and you, you, you are on sympathetic mode and going, 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 and you have to go down and to have problems just to get in and get back to your intuition and to everything, you know? Yes, and, and that's it, is I actually do find with myself and a certain number of people that there are deeper messages in these symptoms. It's true that there's really nothing wrong with us, and we want to keep reinforcing that there's nothing wrong with us, even though we have this chronic pain or this chronic fatigue, assuming you have mind-body symptoms. Um, but at the same time, there can be a deeper message. Like for me, it was learning to work in a way that I enjoy my work instead of just pushing myself to produce because I thought that that was going to make me more valuable in yeah. society's eyes, right? Yeah, I want to be the good girl, the famous girl, the successful girl, yeah. And But what yes. do you want inside? I just want to be happy, <laughs> but I didn't know that. <laughs> That's it. We just want to be happy, you know, and we just want to be loved and accepted, and we're all trying our best to do that so it's like I also learned to find self-compassion for myself like yeah. I can see why the hurt scared part of me was pushing myself um, but part of the message was just to, to back off and to learn to live in my body so I could pick up on my body's messages and actually my body's messages were telling me certain situations were dangerous for me mm -hmm. but I wasn't in touch with them enough Now, this is not to say it was my fault or that it's anybody's fault if they go through sexual assault. But all I'm saying is because it's absolutely not. But I now realize that my intuition is so much better as I'm living in my body and in touch with my body sensations. Um, so that was another message that, that I got through this healing journey. And, and everybody kind of has their own. A lot of them overlap. Um, but I think we really get what we, what we need to learn yeah. if we're open to it. I 100% agree with you. It's like it's messages, you know, and you have to listen to these messages. So it can take t takes time. But uh, but yeah, it's so much growth, you know, if you can understand what the message uh, is, you know. So um, yes, you said that uh, you took poetry uh, classes and it changed you a lot. And it's like you were getting back to connecting with yourself more by doing what felt light and inspiring for you. And I think that it's something we often forget when we want to heal because we are obsessed to feel better and to find answers. Yes, it's true. And I think for me, I think of it as I had to just beat my head against the wall a certain number of times before I realized, well, that really hurts and it's not helping me feel better. These other things feel better. And when I finally kind of, I did reach a point where I had gone to one practitioner who was She called herself a shaman, but she wasn't like a Native American shaman um, by any means. And she was smoking this pipe and she was talking about her cat after I had told her about this trauma. And it was so out of touch with me and the situation. And she charged me 200 US dollars. And I left there just literally saying, that's it. Like, yeah. this is the last person. I am so done giving my power away to people who really, some of them really kind of were charlatans or yeah. maybe they meant well, but they really didn't know what they were doing. Um, all the way to doctors who do know what they're doing but don't understand this mm -hmm. work. And I, I was just done. And so I said, okay, I'm just going to really accept my situation now. I wasn't resigned. I really did feel I could recover, but I just accepted these symptoms are here now. So what can I do to improve my quality of life? I was on disability. I, I wasn't working. I was in my 30s and then in my 40s, but I really shifted my state of mind. It and again. it was that acceptance. It clicked. Yeah, something you know, else. Again. <laughs> sometimes the most unusual people are our teachers. So you thank know? you, cheater. Um, grandma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she became a, a teacher. Because, yeah, I know it. Um, that was just like, it broke my addiction to going to other practitioners. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying we don't sometimes need that. And I did get help through a mind-body coach in this field. But it was from a different vantage. It was from a place of like, I'm in my power. And exactly. I know what's wrong with me, but I 
could use some support. So it was from that place where I signed up for this online poetry class. It was actually an online writing class, but we wrote a lot of poetry and it was really about writing about our emotions and just sharing our deep truths. And it was with women all around the world and it ended up being just so powerful. I felt so seen and heard and I was just loving it and I was you know, engrossed in the writing assignments. And um, that's when I met a woman who had CFS and she had recovered through this mind body work. And she said, Rebecca, I had the same symptoms as you for about the same amount of years. At that point, it was almost 13 years. She said, would you like to have a conversation? I said, sure, but I get migraines if I'm on the phone for more than 10 or 15 minutes. So that was another symptom back then. Um, And she said, okay, we'll just talk for a few minutes. So we're talking for one hour, two (laughs) hours, three hours, no headache. By the end of three hours, I am full of energy. I literally get off the phone and start running around the block. I mean, I hadn't ran in years, probably 13 years. It was so incredible. So what happened in that conversation was something she told me and gave me that no medical provider had in all those years. By the way, she's not even a therapist or a coach. She's just a person who recovered from this. Um, She told me about this work um, that John Sarno described from New York University here in the United States about um, 50 years ago. Um, He called tension myositis syndrome. And I know you've had other people on your show like Dan Buglio talking about it. Um, And Howard Schubner calls mind-body syndrome. This is actually knowledge that ancient sages have known for thousands of years, but it's now being, um, you know, reinvented in the West. And she basically described, yes, these symptoms are 100% real and they're caused by your brain and nervous system, which is still responding as if you're in a threatening situation. You know, it hasn't processed those, those stressors. And... By the end of the conversation, so I was a science journalist, and I'm, I'm a science geek, so she went into the science, so I got it. So it was oh. like to say the clicking was happening, the light bulbs were going off. Yeah. And I was really understanding. Someone wasn't just saying, oh, it's just emotional. She was like, no, emotions impact your brain and nervous system um, in this way, and they express physically when you can't resolve them otherwise. And I just got it. And by the end of that call, she said, Rebecca, you are not sick. Hmm. And I said, I am not sick. And I believed it was so much conviction, the symptoms disappeared. And and that's when I ran around the block. I was like, again, (laughs) (laughs) I gotta go take a jog. Yeah, It was nighttime and it was winter and I just went for a run. Maybe you got a bit of the freeze response. Maybe there was something happening in your in your nervous system. Absolutely. And and I'm glad you brought that up because I do believe with chronic fatigue syndrome, it it tends towards the freeze shutdown response. Absolutely. And that that is a bit harder to get out of. And and so I know sometimes people with fatigue can be frustrated because they say everybody talks about pain. How do you address fatigue? And it is the same way with some caveats. Sometimes it can be helpful to kind of stimulate the nervous system in a gentle way which I later had studied through different um, nervous system modalities. But that's what it did. That's what it did. And it also, because I believed that I was safe, I knew I was okay and that there was nothing wrong with me and it wasn't all these viruses. Yes, I had Epstein-Barr in my system, but so do 95% of all adults, right? I don't know why doctors pointed to that for so many years because most adults will test positive for Epstein-Barr antibodies. So, um, yeah, I really believed it. And when your brain really believes you're okay and your brain feels safe, your body will respond in kind. Mm -hmm. Now, it wasn't just like a one-time spontaneous remission. (laughs) No. Great, and they never came back. It's Um, ebb and flow. Yeah, Yeah, it's ebb and flow. Well, because this was this realization 
But I had been living like a sick person for 13 years and I had so many fears because I had so many triggers. Talking to someone triggered symptoms. Um, anything in the evening, any slightest bit of stimulation, like just a conversation. Um, you know, eating certain foods triggered symptoms, uh, going for a walk, all these things. So my brain had these learned associations that doing these things was dangerous. But I knew I was on the right path. So some of the symptoms started coming back. You know, I read The Mind Body Prescription by John Sarno. I read Howard Schubner's book, Unlearn Your Pain, which I really love. Yeah, it's um, amazing. Amazing. You're familiar with that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it also has a workbook and you can work through yeah, exactly. some different exercises. Mm. Um, but I also got a mind body coach, Jim Prusak, who's a wonderful coach that also has a YouTube channel in this field, and um, worked with him for a number of months on really learning to feel the sensations in my body through a lens of safety. Mm. Because fatigue is, is heaviness, you know, it's like, bur for me, I had a lot of burning, um, heaviness, dullness. But as you start approaching it as sensations and you send safety messages back to your brain, um, the sensations aren't so threatening. And then they start shifting. And then my experience was I, I wasn't really very in touch with my emotions, but as I would feel the sensations, whether it was what you'd call pain or fatigue, it might be burning, shooting, spasming, itching, dullness. It can be heat. everything. It can be any sensation. Um, Often that does start revealing more emotions and sort of shifting into emotions because emotions are buried in the symptoms. I mean, the symptoms are emotional, expressing in a physical way. And as we can be with the physical sensations, it sometimes can open the portal for emotions. And I did have a lot of releases. Um, anger came up. It's very natural to be angry in the situation I was in. Um, also, you know, just sadness, shame all sorts of different emotions that came up that I learned to just kind of hold space for. Yeah. And right. It's funny what you are saying because um, I totally agree with that the pain and the symptoms are related to uh, deep down emotions and it's funny because my uh, my boyfriend uh, yesterday fell and uh, so he, he, he strained his ankle and so because I have um, uh, a past uh, uh, with uh, having issues and uh, neuroplastic pain all day long, I had pain in my right ankle like him. So it was difficult in a way, but funny because now I, I know how to uh, feel my, my or to feel my mind with safety messages. And I'm just like, okay, I, I noticed that I have some pain, but I know that it is neuroplastic because I, in, I think in the deep down, I'm scared of, of having new pain, you know? So it's, uh, it's funny yeah. how it can function. And thankfully, education is really, really important. And also, like you say, what is crucial is to feel uh, our feelings with safe, safely, you know, like reconnecting to the emotions that are stored in our systems. Oh, my goodness. I love that you brought that up. So it's like his pain was contagious. Exactly. And I still <laughs> Even feel it was from an injury. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I still feel yeah. that, you know, but I know yeah. now I know it. That's the yeah. whole difference. Well, yeah, and you can start to watch your brain and be almost entertained by it and amused yeah, by like it. Yeah, like a detective. Like, oh, my oh. goodness. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. like there is no way this is contagious. And, and <laughs> exactly, it's not a flu. Studies. Right, it's like the flu. There's actually studies that show there's this phenomenon of social contagion where, for instance, when medical students are studying certain kind of ailments in their training, they'll start developing some of the symptoms. So <laughs> it's that like exposure to it combined with the fear that fear. then can, the fear, the yeah, fear is right. the fuel. But like you said, you have these tools. And so do you, for instance, give yourself affirmations and safety messages or how do you exactly yeah that? so i i um i say to my to my brain and my body it's so it's okay uh, you know it's my brain you know who is uh, misinterpreting the signals in my body it's okay my body i love you i know it's a false alarm and uh, you know i just trying to not feel with, to not feed with the fear really it's important because i was so much and always uh, entertaining the pain with the fear i was so scared so it was my my most important message Stage, you know regarding everything was scary I was always in tension you know and so now I'm, I'm like okay I will walk anyway because I know that this pain is not true you know 
oh, that is so beautiful that you could catch it and you didn't have to go down this rabbit hole of going to doctors and getting it checked, yeah. which would have scared you more. Yeah. But I found similar messages were really helpful to me to really remind myself I'm safe and okay. And, and you know, that was beautiful. I, I love you, body. Instead of, we, we often turn against our body exactly. when it hurts, but it's trying to help us. It's just based on a misperception yeah. of danger. And so that like, yeah, I love myself. Um, mm-hmm. For me, giving myself self-compassion has been really yeah. helpful. Yeah. I think Absolutely. compassion, it's a, it's, a, it's a word that you used uh, earlier. And for me, it's like, I think for you too, learning to have compassion to your body, to, to yourself was life changing. I think like, it's okay, buddy. I love you so much. It's going to be okay. Like, like you will be talking to a little child, you know, like for me, it's that image and it works so, so much. It's a bit like not naive, but for some people, it's a bit woo woo or I don't know, but it works a lot because yeah, you are, you are sending some good messages to your body. Absolutely. And of course, you know, we have to choose language that's true to us. Um, But there's actually a lot of research around self-compassion now. I I really like the work of Kristen Neff, who's here in the States. And she's done a lot of research that self-compassion really turns down self-criticism, turns down fear. And we know in the mind-body world that then that can turn down symptoms. Um, And so it really is treating yourself as that scared Mm. child or a loved one you care about and um, with the self-compassion piece that she teaches there's sort of three steps where one is just acknowledging I'm I'm suffering I'm in pain and that ties into the mind-body work because we would say oh well I'm feeling these these burning or throbbing sensations in my body and just maybe acknowledge it not fixate on it Um, it's really natural that I would feel scared right now is the second piece of, of common humanity, realizing it's human to feel this way. And the third piece is self-kindness. Like, it's okay. I love you. It's going to be all right. You know, what do you really need right now to feel safe? So I found this is helpful for quite a few people that I work with who were trying to criticize them themselves into getting well again. And instead, there's, there's one man I work with in Australia who was pretty much incapacitated in excruciating pain for actually several decades. And he's like, I've been doing all this TMS work. I get it. I understand it. Why isn't it working? And we really understood through working together that it was um, just the shift from self-criticism to self-compassion made all the difference. He's jogging now like (sighs) miles every day, push-ups, squats, sit-ups. And he just says to himself, like, it's okay, buddy. You've got this. You can do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's like I want to cry, you know, when I hear that because – that must have been so, uh, so great for him. Like, oh, yeah, here it is. I got a solution just because I was lacking some compassion. I was so hard toward myself, you know. Yes, and that's what we were talking about earlier, that sometimes there's a message in the symptoms. And so first we need to learn there's nothing really wrong with our body when we have neuroplastic symptoms. Yeah. Um, but then it can be that, you know, if we're criticizing ourselves, pushing ourselves, pressuring ourselves, people pleasing, you know, Ooh, putting yeah. other people's needs. Okay, yeah, we all know that one, right? In yeah. this world. Um, putting other people's needs before our own, that doesn't feel safe. That doesn't feel safe to the brain and nervous system. Because it's like we have to really be present to ourselves, to our body, to our inner truth. And and to self-compassion and self-love. And I believe that's our natural state. And so it feels safer. And then that turns down the danger signal in the brain. Yeah, exactly. And I'm trying to find the questions I got regarding the, yeah, the, the personality traits, because we are talking about that. And it's so important because when um, I noticed that uh, regarding people who have chronic pain or other symptoms, some disease uh, is that they often are perfectionists, high stress persons, self-critical, sensitive ones, like you just said. And uh, so it seems that that personality, uh, personality traits play a big role on those issues, you know. And so I'm wondering how you were before you, 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 you were like uh, you wanted to be a successful person. So you were a perfectionist. But um, how do you recognize yourself in my little description? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check, 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 check. Pretty much all of them. Yeah, right? but I think it's common traits, you know. 
It is common traits. In John Sarno's books, he wrote about these personality traits, and so many people will say, oh, I felt like I was reading my, my yeah. biography. Um, I think I've noticed with people, it can be that we lean towards one or the other more. I lent more towards perfectionism. And, you know, these things are more coping strategies we learned in childhood, often because we Maybe we had loving parents, but our needs weren't fully met. When I trace it back, I can see why um, I wasn't understanding math very well early on, and, and it was it was frustrating to somebody who was helping me with math, and I used to feel so much pressure, and I sort of unconsciously decided, well, I'm going to be a perfectionist. I'm going to work extra hard at everything. I'm going to mm. study extra hard so I won't ever face that anger or that yeah. punishment. Now, these are all subconscious processes happening, um, but we develop these traits. Some people become people pleasers because maybe they don't feel unconditionally loved by their parents. They don't feel understood by their parents. They may even be abused and neglected, mm. and so they learn to please other people at the expense of themselves. And there's really pivotal studies that have shown that adverse childhood experiences like abuse and neglect early on um, do predispose people to chronic pain later in life. There's a much higher incidence of chronic pain later. But we now know with this work, it's neuroplastic pain, and we can shift those personality traits. And my experience is we don't have to completely change our personality and become a different person because we can't do that. Yeah. And we really want to be more of our authentic self, but it's recognizing when these traits are really revving up our system, causing stress, and just the mindfulness piece, often we can kind of back off a little bit. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't know if you are, the, you are talking about the ACE study? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. it's absolutely amazing and it's so interesting, yeah. But yeah, it's like you said, it's, it's good to know that you can change a bit to just re by respecting yourself, your own limits, your own your beliefs and everything. So it's a big intro introspection work, you know, but you have to it do the really work. It really is. It's deep work. It really is. I mean, there's a there's a small percentage of people that just read the book and they have that book cure because maybe they don't have a lot of the underlying personality yeah. traits or they don't have a lot of trauma. Um, but that's really a small percentage that I see. It's, it's yeah. most of us need to do some deeper work. And it's so satisfying that when you do this deeper work and you start treating yourself with more love and being more true to yourself and your choices in relationships, in work, in just how you view your body, it's so satisfying. I mean, you almost get to the point where it's like, this getting rid of the symptoms is secondary. And it's so it's interesting because I work with people now um, as a coach and as a teacher. And sometimes what happens inevitably is they just stop talking about the fatigue or the pain or the tinnitus or the irritable bowel syndrome. And they just don't bring it up anymore. And they're talking more about other parts of life. And, and one day I'll say, what about that chronic pain in your knee? And they're like, oh, i I guess I haven't noticed it in a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. It drops away, yeah. And then, um, but it is through this this deeper dive, which is is so fulfilling. Yeah. And and I do find I don't know how it was for you. Um, some people really like going into expressive writing and journaling and just really letting their feelings out, like venting them onto the page. And there's some research to show that that's that can be helpful. Um, I didn't need as much of that. For me, it was much more somatic. It was the somatic tracking, which is really tracking sensations in the body through a lens of safety, doing different audio meditations, um, feeling my emotions. That was really a key piece of my recovery. I would say the knowledge itself and just learning to be with the sensations, both in formal kind of meditation practices and also just throughout the day just noticing some sensations in the body, as well as bringing in positive sensations or neutral sensations, like the breath, just really tracking the breath. As I'm talking with you now, I'm noticing the bottoms of my feet on the floor. Yeah. I can feel a little bit of sensation. I feel a little bit of texture there uh, at the hardwood floor. So it's, it's remaining more embodied and that sends safety, safety signals um, back yeah. to the brain that we're, we're paying attention. Yeah, I, 
I 100% again agree with you because for me, I think it was similar to you. It was like I suffered a lot from anxiety and uh, it was really the symptoms were big, big, big. So I was so scared of the uh, the anxiety and the anxiety obviously uh, were, was, uh, was getting bigger, you know. And one day I just let it go and just accept the sensation. So I had lots of pins and needles and pains and nerve pains in the whole of my body and I accepted that. So it, it went up and then poof, it crashed, you know, it went uh, like down, but it took a few hours, I think. And so I began to understand that I was in resistance all the time. And so the somatic meditation, absolutely like you changed my, my, my life because I, I meditate like twice a day with somatic meditations. I love that. You know, it's like the, the cup of water that you just showed us uh, at, at the beginning of, the, of this episode. Uh, it's like I'm emptying my cup, you know, of stress each day. And I noticed that uh, I had less pain. I, I had the less acne, less inflammation, of course. And also like, yeah, journaling like Nicole Sachs uh, is talking about. I did that for a month. Um, so I'm not doing that a lot anymore. But just yeah, emptying my cup with the words too uh, were, were interesting for me. And uh, and yes, somatic tracking is really important because yeah, you build, you're creating new connect uh, neural pathways. So yeah, like you, I think. And uh, but again, everybody is different. For some some persons, journaling will be awesome. For other, it will be meditation. And like like you say, being in the being connected to the present moment. Like you t you told us about Eckhart Tolle, it was amazing. The the books are incredibly interesting it's the basis but we we are not connected to the present moment so we are not connected to the body who lives in the present moment so yeah i fully agree with you yes and, and it takes a lot of courage to do what you did to really be present to the anxiety yeah. right because anxiety is actually telling you to run from the tiger or to, to fight the tiger whatever is the perceived threat, but our brain is reacting the same way, whether it's a physical threat or a psychological threat. And so um, to be with it, it does take courage and it shifts the patterns, but it's so powerful. Yeah, I really see anxiety is behind many, if not most of these symptoms. Of course. Right, it's underneath it. And actually, when my fatigue started lifting, because I came out of that shutdown freeze state, what's called dorsal vagal in, in polyvagal theory, as you start lifting out of that, you come into sympathetic activation. And so then anxiety comes. So I then had a lot of anxiety. Yeah, and like a, you would sort of sit with it and yeah. you want to run. And sometimes I would need to move, yeah. but I would move in a way because you want to get out that physical energy in a way that I was aware of what was happening, that I wasn't really in danger. Yeah. Um, Sometimes I would, though, imagine I was kind of escaping whatever the perceived danger was as yeah, I was works. moving my body. It, it works, does. Yeah, exactly. Visualization is important. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, because our brain doesn't know whether we're imagining it or really experiencing it. And I was just like you, where I practiced somatic meditation, I would say twice a day, especially for a period of months. I still do it every day. I, I may or may not listen to a, a recording, I just do it myself, usually at night to just sort of process the day, um, to come back into my body, to feel sensations, to process any emotions. And I love it so much, I, I can't picture giving it up. Yeah. Although it does become more and more of a way of life where you don't necessarily need as much time in, in a practice, you know, when you're living it throughout the day. But what you said was really important, the fact that uh, to get off of the, of the freeze of the shutdown response, you have to go to the sympathetic mode and so it can be really uh, Im impressive, you know, for our system because, of course, anxiety and sympathetic uh, symptoms are really, uh, yeah, important. And so you can you can shut down again. So it's uh, it's um, you must be careful with that. You must be educated to know how it works, actually. Well, absolutely, because otherwise you you kind of think you're going crazy, and you yeah. do think you're under a threat. Because if you're in sympathetic mode, your thoughts are going to match that, and whatever is around you, you're going to perceive as a threat. So we want to learn about the states of our nervous system. That was something I I sort of have added to my understanding of the TMS work, is really studying the nervous system in these different states, and actually going into sympathetic activation 
gets you out of freeze and shutdown, which is, is helpful with chronic fatigue. You, you actually have more capacity. You have more clarity. You have more energy. Um, but like you said, you need to know what to do with that. And so I found different techniques in addition to somatic tracking um, that can calm the nervous system. I mean, one of them I just mentioned, grounding, really feeling your feet in your seat and something called orienting, which yeah. comes from Peter Levine, yeah. where you're, you know, you're looking around you, you're in your senses, you're just sort of taking in the objects around you or out the window, you're listening to the sounds, you're coming into your senses because yeah. that brings you out of the, the ruminating mind. Um, things like humming, humming or singing actually activate the, the vagus nerve. That can really calm the system or, or the VU sound, which is something that Peter Levine teaches. So sometimes these additional tools can be, can be really helpful. Yeah, yeah, I think you got to test everything, you know, when you are trying to be uh, taught, just to know what works for you, because it depends on the yes. people. It depends on the people. I agree with you. I'm not a black or white person that says just because I really recovered through the somatic meditations, everybody has to because I meet people um, who really do well with the expressive writing. Mm. But I do find they do better with expressive writing when it's an embodied experience. A lot yeah. of people that are saying, oh yeah, but I wrote about things. Well, They may just be writing about the circumstance and not their emotions. And even if they're it. writing about emotions, yeah, they don't feel it. So to me, it's like we have to process this in our body. And, you know, the body and the brain are, are one, but they're always in communication. Yeah, exactly. Oh, Hallelujah. I love this conversation. <laughs> oh, I do too. I love geeking out. It's, it's funny, you know, it how it can thing. become like a passion, you know, when you're suffering. It's often the case. You change your, 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 your life, you change uh, everything, you know, your job. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's uh, everything is linked. But um, so let's talk a bit about the, the graded exposure, uh, which I did too, in order to learn to walk again. And it's really important because you cannot go from A to Z in a minute, you know, your body, your nervous system your brain need time and reassurance to get back to your life you don't want to retraumatize uh, to retraumatize your nervous system and that's a mistake that can often be made because you you want to go there again you're going to go you want to go fast you know absolutely i'm so glad you brought that up too because people when they do get the light bulb moment with this work just may be tempted to go out and run a marathon. And, you know, there are people who, who do take a more extreme approach and they just run through the pain or walk through the pain or bike through the pain. There's a doctor in the United States, John Strax, who just kept biking and biking even though he was in so much pain and the pain did turn off, I think on mile four or something like that. So again, I find that's like a minority of people. Yeah. It's people that have a certain personality and maybe a, an all-in kind of personality. Yeah. That does not work for most people. It's really got to be like slow graded steps. Yeah, and for me, after being you know, so symptomatic, and I won't even say so sick for so long, because I realized I wasn't sick, but I was very, very symptomatic, and I, and I mm. certainly felt sick. Um, But you reframe it. You reframe it so you don't see yourself as a sick person or a broken person anymore. Um, but I did start doing these different activities. So, for example, um, physical activities because I could just maybe walk down the block or something like yeah. that. So I would walk a little bit farther. I would walk around the block or walk into my neighborhood. And I would get symptoms either then or later with the post-exertional malaise, but I didn't care. I knew what the cause was at this point. And I knew that when you get symptoms, it's actually a point of power. It's the best time to retrain your brain. Exactly. I mean, it's like easy to retrain your brain when you don't have symptoms and you feel okay. Yeah. But when the symptoms come up and you can be mindful and you can watch them and you can say, I'm okay, body, I am safe, this is okay. And, and, and I became aware that even though I would feel this, this heaviness, like I was being dragged to the ground and somehow sometimes kind of dizzy or lightheaded. Mm. Um, and, and sometimes I would need to just sit and take a break. But I would just say, I've got this. I can do this. I'm retraining my brain. And, you know, maybe I'd get some pushback from my body, but it was like I kept going. And if I did need to rest, that was okay, too. I wasn't making an issue of it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And I wasn't beating myself up for it or making it mean something because you just, you don't want to create more fear. And then like if I would, I would meet a friend in the evening for 
coffee or dinner or something like that. And that was the worst thing for me. In the past, it would trigger so much insomnia. And for days, I'd feel like I have the flu. But I started doing it in little steps. Like I'd meet someone in the afternoon and then and then um, maybe later for dinner. And I would get insomnia um, for a while, for maybe some weeks or even a couple months. But I would just sort of lay there. And insomnia is like any other symptom. Yeah. I just would lay there. I would rest. I would think, look, I've gotten through lots of nights like this before. I'm just going to enjoy it. I'm going to feel my body and my breath. If I was really awake, I would just get up and read or do something more enjoyable, take my mind off of it. Eventually, I'll fall back asleep, and, and, I, and I would. Yeah, but that's how you let go of resistance. That's how you let go of resistance, is it's like accepting what is showing up in your body right now yeah. and knowing that even though the symptoms are coming up, they're trying to protect you, but if you send that feedback that I'm okay, there's no reason for these symptoms, I'm not worried about the symptoms, um, but they're also unnecessary. Um, your brain eventually follows in suit. And after, for me, I mean, it did take some months because yeah. I was, it, I had the CFS, well, CFS slash TMS um, for 13 years. Yeah. But I did, and I kept increasing. There was this trip I wanted to take to meet those women in the writing group, but it was across the country. It was in Pennsylvania, and I'm in California. And I was so scared, I thought, uh, to fly again, to be with, like, sleeping in a house with all these people I don't know, eating different food. It was challenging a lot of triggers. Really triggering, yeah. Yeah, I but I had been working my way up to it, and I did it. And I did the trip, and I had the best time. I had the time of my life. And I had a lot of symptoms that trip, but I didn't care. It was yeah. like, can't harm me. They absolutely can't harm me. And then the next trip I took, there was way less symptoms and so on. And then they just, you know, died down. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh, I love, yeah. yeah, it's cool because it's optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And sometimes you you got so much pleasure and you got to take advantage of feeling those good emotions, you know, even though you have some symptoms, you just focus on the good feelings of the good emotion of the connections with the other, you know. Yes, absolutely. You can shift your focus to the good feeling emotions and then the symptoms kind of like down regulate a little bit and they're less. And they're just not bothering you so much because you're not fixated on them. Mm, yeah. And you're not trying to fix them. It's just, and you know, this this whole work gives you so much more freedom in your life, doesn't totally. it? Because it can project out to other situations. There's a lot of things we can't control. So it's just learning to kind of be with them and, you know, watch our reactions to things and find peace in the moment with life as it is. Mm. Um, and there's just so much more, I find so much more, peace and calm in my life than there ever was before all this happened. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree with that. Can you talk a bit more about outcome independence? Because that is also really important, but not so easy as when people begin to feel the symptoms again, while trying to, to be a little, uh, you know, to do a little more, they can often be, be scared and can be triggered. So how did you learn to not be scared of your emotions and sensations that were coming up? Yes. Well, the outcome independence is really important, which is the indifference to the symptoms. And you're right. It's hard to just suddenly not care that you're in excruciating pain or exhaustion. Um, so you want to work up to that, you know, first by imagining the activity. And then if you get symptoms, they're usually mild and you can imagine it in a more positive or joyful way. And then as you actually start to do the activity and you do get symptoms, um, For me, I guess it was helpful to realize I have had these symptoms hundreds, thousands of times, and I've mm. gotten through it all those times, but now I know the answer. So this is different. It's not just like fruitless suffering. It's like I'm literally retraining my brain through the outcome independence. When I understood that being indifferent to the symptoms actually teaches the brain that you're okay, that you're not running from the tiger. Mm. Um, It just made it like a, a great challenge, almost like a, a game, you know, mm. instead of just an act of suffering. So it was, I think, reframing it. And then again, just kind of being with the sensations, becoming curious about them. I mean, this sounds crazy to say now, and, and I know it's hard when you're in a lot of pain because yeah. pain's a very yes. loud sensation. Um, 
but especially with the fatigue, I mean, the sensations kind of started becoming interesting to me. It was like, wow, there's this universe of sensations in my body and there's pulsing and heaviness and, and they shift and they move around. And it became interesting to me um, instead of annoying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a good uh, mindset, you know, but sometimes it's hard because you got the symptoms operatives. So uh, when for me, like when it is new, like a new sensations of pain, I call them sensations, but it's like pain. Uh, that's where I noticed that my brain is getting, uh, you know, a bit hyper vigilant because it's all new. It's like, I, I think I have, uh, I had like 30 kind of pains, you know, all around my, my body. But when it's new, it's when I'm beginning to be hyper vigilant again. So I'm really trying to send safety messages, but it's harder when, it's, when uh, you are not used to that new pain, you know? In a way. Yes, it can be louder and it's trying to get your attention. And it's, I mean, you have a very creative brain, right? It yeah. keeps creating these sensations in different areas. And when it realizes mm -hmm. you're onto it, like, you know, you're near your back is neuroplastic pain. It may try a different area to get your attention. Um, it's the same technique of knowing those absolutely can't hurt you. They're not dangerous. And sometimes when that's happening, you know, it sounds like you're doing all the deeper work. I find, though, that, you know, for me tuning into, like, what's happening emotionally? Because yeah. my brain's trying to really distract me from an emotion right now so much that it's creating a whole new symptom. And just tune back into, like, what's going on emotionally inside of me? And just sort of like listening and seeing if there's an emotion or if there's a message. Yeah. Yeah. You've got to learn to scan your, your body just to be connected with the sensations and be patient because it takes a few minutes for the, for the sensations and emotions to come up, I think. It does. Well, and because, you know, we've been pushing them away for so long and understandably because they're so uncomfortable and most of us learn in childhood that it's not safe to exactly. feel the emotions. Yeah. And so it's been a it's been an important strategy to push them down and not to criticize ourselves. But it's like that little child you mentioned or um Yeah, someone we've cast out. We have to like gently coax them back in with, with warmth, with kindness, with consistency. So with the emotions, we want to just keep like opening that safe space for them to come up. Because yeah, as the symptoms jump around, we know that there's there's some emotion um, that our brain is perceiving as threatening. It's it's trying to protect us from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so get more into the body and the sensation. And it's funny because now I just have to, to just lie down and welcome the sensation. I don't need emotions. I don't need to get triggered. You know, I don't need to, to use the mind and just have to connect with my body wisdom. You know, it's funny. Beautiful. I'm the same way. I love going right into the sensation <laughs> because to me, that's the raw energy of yeah. these symptoms. Now, granted, I mean, sometimes that's the strategy. Other times we just want to keep walking or keep working or go on with our life and just kind of say, look, this is okay. I'm going to keep living my life. Yeah. So it's kind of a combination. And it's funny yeah. because for me, so I think that I got this uh, like neuroplastic pain today regarding my, my boyfriend's uncle, but also because uh, one week ago we, were, we went to Amsterdam and I know that... Um, Uh, before having my CRPS, I had that in my knees and then fibromyalgia or every pain in, in every corner of my body. I was in the US actually and I, I, uh, I, I did some sport before going to the US and I um, hurt myself while doing some sports and my brain took that as the warning sign that you don't have to, you don't need to do some sport before going to vacation otherwise you will hurt yourself. And so before going to Amsterdam, Guess what it happened? I had some new pain, you know. So I was like, I don't even care. I know what it is. I will go to Amsterdam <laughs> and to and enjoy. But it's funny how it works and how the trauma is still here. You know, sometimes it can take like years or months. It depends, but it's actually funny. And like you say, you just don't take that so seriously anymore, even though also it is really triggering sometimes. And don't get me wrong, it's complicated sometimes. But, ju but just continue to, to do your life also, you know. Yes, and that it's so crazy how the brain remembers uh. that. So it remembered that association between sports before a trip, and it just, it, and we're talking about the primitive part of the brain, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit rudimentary, and it's just linking things together 
in a conditioned response, like with Pavlov's dog. <laughs> and so um, it's just like, yeah, make sure she doesn't play sports before the vacation to keep her safe. And it's great. You caught that. And you can say, look, I'm on to you. <laughs> I'm safe and this is okay. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> I know you. <laughs> But it's not easy though, you know, it's not easy because of course when you feel those emotion and those pain, it's always triggering and sometimes because you are connected to not the best parts in your mind, it's like you forget how to do those things. But it's a process and it's a, a new routine to get to. It is because, I mean, we do have, then we start developing the neural pathways in the brain for these symptoms, but all we need to do is kind of interrupt those neural pathways and return to the healthy neural pathways because you also have healthy neural pathways in your brain that are used to playing sports with no problems at all, that are used yeah. to traveling with no problems <laughs> at all. So yeah, you don't want to feed the ones that are um, causing the symptoms so you can kind of return to those other neural pathways in the brain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I know you do somatic meditations every night, which are like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm a huge fan. Uh, I do the, I do them a few times a day. Uh, and I want to know that, uh, what you change and adopt it as a daily routine to keep your health at the top and continue to stay calm, present in your nervous system. You told us about a lot of things, but what did you do? And maybe s some other stuff? I don't know. Just, uh, yes, just curious. Yes. Yes. I, I definitely do some kind of embodiment practice to start the day and end the day. So um, usually in the morning, it's yoga. Yeah, I'll practice yoga, but I do it in a whole different way than I used to. I mean, it's <laughs> really feeling body sensations, right? Because it's possible to practice yoga or anything else like being fitness. totally checked out of your body, like fitness. Yeah. yeah. So it's really like that embodiment. I'll also do a little meditation, but I used to meditate more in my mind, like with a mantra. Now it's just like noticing the breath. I usually start the day that way, noticing the breath, feeling, kind of checking in with um, what are my physical sensations in my body? What emotions are present? So you could call those emotional sensations. What's the state of my mind? And then what's my intuition? Mm. So I'll kind of check in with those four layers. Sometimes it's a longer meditation. Sometimes it's a, it's a short one. Um, and the yoga. And then typically I end the day with something like somatic tracking where I'm just, you know, tracking sensations in the body and I'm kind of noticing, oh, is there, are there any unprocessed emotions or I'll just sort of feel maybe there's like a little tension that's, that's crept in. Um, and I find that actually broke the insomnia issue that I had for so many years. That was actually my worst symptom, I would say. Oh yeah, it's um, awful. Oh, I know it is. Oh. And so like doing the somatic tracking before bed um, and meditations like that really, really helped just calm down my whole system. So yeah. those I really continue. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny because we are, we, are, we are similar because I didn't have lots of insomnia, but sometimes when, when uh, I was suffering too much anxiety, I couldn't sleep like uh, maybe before 4 a.m. So it was not like month, but it was... I know what it is and it's awful that you have to live that so many times. And yeah, I'm really um, happy that like you two, uh, just connecting to my body and my sensation, it helps you know, like getting out of the mind, connecting to the body and so poof, you sleep. <laughs> it's, all, it's great. <laughs> exactly. That's what so it great. is. It's getting out of the mind and bringing yeah. that energy down into the body. Exactly. And then we fall asleep. So it's whatever helps with that. Yes. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. So um, we are going to end this episode with rapid fire questions. And those questions are more general. If you had to keep one book, which one would it be? I would say A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Yeah, I love, oh, I love, I love it. him. It's just so timeless. Whenever I open that book, it's just I can look at one page and it brings me into that place of just acceptance and peace because he, he's in that space. Yeah, it's a right? good reminder every time, yeah. It is, and that, by the way, that book and his work, I feel set me up to really receive the mind-body knowledge because my mind was so open and receptive, then I really, it clicked. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you, you got some steps, you know, before healing and yeah, yeah, being connected to the present moment and maybe having some introspection work, being more a bit more spiritual. Uh, I think it, it, it is, yeah, the steps before healing, you know, it's like whole wholeness you know 
Yes, they all count. It's, it's yeah. like reclaiming our wholeness and yeah. the different aspects of ourselves we've cast aside just to, to get by and to protect ourselves, our emotional self, our spiritual self, you know, our physical self. So it's, it's reclaiming all that. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. practice can we all do and add to our daily routine? Oh, well, I think it's so important to... Um, a couple things. Mm -hmm. One is to notice sensations in the body. So for a lot of people, though, that's really just helpful to either notice where you're grounded. So where you're touching the floor and say the chair, if you're sitting, just sort of notice the surfaces that you're on. So as I'm typing or working on the computer or talking with you, I have a little bit of a tension that comes back into the bottoms of the feet, sort of my foundation and where I'm supported. Yeah. That's really helpful for a lot of people. Other people prefer just touching back into the breath, just sort of noticing the rise and fall of the breath in the chest or the belly area. Those are really, it's amazing how much they can calm the nervous system. Um, but also asking throughout the day, like, what am I feeling emotionally, yeah. especially if you get symptoms to bring it back to what's happening emotionally because you can be sure there's some varied emotion underneath that. Yeah, exactly. So that can be a really helpful practice to just start retraining your mind from the physical to the emotional. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was like three practices, but... <laughs> no, I love that. I, I could listen to 100 if you want. <laughs> Those are good. Those yeah, are good. exactly. I love that. Yeah, choose you know, what you need as a person and kind of what resonates with you. Exactly, exactly. Again, we are all different. It depends on everything. So yeah, just listen to yourself, but test everything, you know, so that you can know. <laughs> yeah, like our bodies are our own laboratory. So try it out, and <laughs> see how it feels. Yeah. But not necessarily, but one thing I want to say, don't try it out to get rid of the symptoms. <laughs> try it out just to see if it maybe brings a little more awareness or like emotional awareness or physical awareness or a little more calm. Yeah. Because that's a very different motivation than doing it to get rid of the symptoms, which will just scare your nervous system more. Yeah, really useful tips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so again, a general question, the best breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh oh well it depends on the time of year because I like to eat sort of seasonally a yeah. bit but um like when it's cooler out I love warm cereals like oatmeal but I put in fresh berries and nuts and uh, flax seeds or hemp seeds and almond milk and lots of spices like nutmeg and cardamom mm. um and then if it's if it's warmer out maybe more like a smoothie or a a chia pudding or something like that. Yeah, that's my <laughs> I girl. I love that too. I love, yes, I love I love food. <laughs> <laughs> eating with the seasons and um, making it a celebration. Yeah, and yeah. it's like it's completely woo woo what I'm going to say. But now when I drink water and when I I eat uh, before eating and drinking, I always say some stuff like I love you, thank you, food. Like being you know in the field in the energy field of gratitude, I think it changes again the nervous system. Also, you can you you are more receptive to good stuff. So yeah, yes. gratitude yes. everywhere. You know. Not bypassing, oh, though. Exactly. <laughs> right, exactly. I think that, yeah, how we eat, like the intention we bring in, is as important as what we eat. And the gratitude can shift so much. And then when you start to, like, we'll say a little thank you before meals, and um, you just realize how much bounty you have if you have food in front of you. It's, it's incredible just yeah. to to take that in. Again, connecting with the present moment. Coucou Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eckhart. <laughs> what is your mantra or the a sentence that is really important to you? Oh, I would say look for the gift in what you've been given. Look for the gift in what you've been given. Because for so long, I really thought what I was given was a, a curse. I thought, this is so unfair. You know, why did this happen to me? I didn't do anything to deserve this attack and then 13 years of illness and so much that I lost in those years. But I really have found through that experience, I've regained myself. I mean, my true self, you know, yeah. the core of who I am, my authentic self as a person, work that is so satisfying in a way that it never was before. Um, 
yeah, just living more in my intuition and my heart. And so these circumstances that can seem so challenging, whether you're in chronic pain or fatigue or some other challenge, um, I know for a while it could seem really annoying when someone says, oh, try to be grateful. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. You know, it's, it's not, you may not be there yes. right away. And it <laughs> took me years to get there. But just sort of be open to the gift that's being given because I really believe there is a benevolence in our lives and in our bodies. And they're trying to guide us back home to ourselves. Mm. What will you say to your younger self, like 20-year-old you? Oh, I so wish I could be there with a the 20-year-old me now with all I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would really be to trust your gut, mm. honor yourself. And I like this quote by a poet named David White. And he says something like, um, anyone or anything that does not bring you alive is too small for you. Mm. So to really... I would mm. say that to myself that there were people that really weren't treating me very well. Unfortunately, that led to the, the sexual violence. Mm. Um, to learn when people aren't treating you well, you know, you deserve to be treated with respect. When boundaries are being crossed, they often start small and they get bigger. You can say no, you can walk away, um, you can get help. You know, I'd also say talk to someone about. Um, traumas that have happened to you because being able to express it can really relieve a lot of stress. It doesn't have to turn into physical symptoms. Yeah. Um, yeah. And know that you deserve to be, you deserve to be loved first by yourself. And yeah. then as you learn to love yourself and respect and honor yourself, um, you know, you will, you will attract others who do the same. Yeah, exactly. Completely. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> you too. That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. Anything you want to share with us? Mm. Yeah, just for people who have chronic symptoms that there is a way out. And if you have mind-body symptoms that we know are caused by the brain and nervous system and there isn't tissue damage, um, there's, a, there's a very clear way out and it's going to guide you back home to yourself. And so just be open to ideas. I know it can be, um, yeah, it can be a little hard to digest at first that this could be caused from emotional experiences. Yeah. But, you know, just listen to yourself, listen to your truth, go at your own pace. And so much more is possible than, than what we're led to believe. Yeah. Ah, so true. Again, I'm sorry to repeat my words, but when I like four, four, five years ago, when I was in deep pain, I was like, "What? Sorry, but what the fuck? I, uh, what the fucking fuck? Like, it's not possible. I will, I will end up my life like this." And uh, and no, actually, it's a process. Like, you have to go really uh, in the dark, you know, dark night of the soul too. And one day there will be the sun you know like uh, it will be clearer and clearer and but you got to do the work and you got to open yourself to new possibilities and it's a process it takes time but it's a process and the more you work on yourself on your path on your emotional state and everything and the more the possibilities will come in your life you know i think that's you, you got to believe the universe in a way I, i'm not uh you know in religion or anything but just i think that there are lots of synchronicities sometimes You know, I think that's that we everything is a lesson and you can you can learn so much by our pain, you know, in a way. Oh, absolutely. I think it was Albert Einstein that said something like you can look at nothing as a miracle or everything as a miracle. Yeah. And I know that it's so hard when you're in that dark night yeah. of the soul to embrace it. And that's okay but um it's beautiful lena that you are offering this perspective to people in in france and around europe um and opening people to possibilities because it does make our lives so much more enriching to be able to kind of use our body challenges as a portal for deeper understandings um, and a more fulfilling life yeah and i'm sure that the two of us um are happier now you know It's like Absolutely. I'm happy it happens. Actually, <laughs> of course I would I would not yeah. have said that like five years ago. Of course not, you know. <laughs> But now I can say I'm no. so much happier, so much connected to myself, my intuition, my like you said earlier, my authentic self. 
that's a huge yes. personal traveling, you know. Well, and it's so beautiful because look, you're sharing it with others now. Yeah. From finding your authentic self, which you only could have found by going through this dark night and really finding yeah. the answers within yourself. Um, then you can share it with others. You gotta and, you put know, the express- hand into the sorry the <laughs> sheet, but it's true because otherwise you cannot bring light to the to the sheet. <laughs> sorry, but <laughs> it's true. I mean, we all wish we could just like bypass that dark night and the challenge. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I say suffering's been my greatest teacher. Not that I need that anymore, universe. Yeah, exactly. But <laughs> no, it's okay. No more. <laughs> I've got it. I've got the message. But, you know, when when it comes, because we all have different life changes, you learn these same principles, which to me are like old wisdom um, from ancient traditions of just learning to kind of be with life as it happens and, you know, embrace the lessons and find your own inner truth. Mm. And we just do that with a lot of motivation when we have chronic symptoms. Yeah. Yeah. But again, educate yourself on on neuroplastic pain, chronic pain. There are so many books right now. We are lucky to have some web some good websites, some programs, everything. We got Rebecca also. So <laughs> actually where can we find you? Yeah, I and I do have a lot of free resources on my website, which is RebeccaTolan.com. So I write a blog and there's a somatic tracking meditation in the blog. And then if you want a longer somatic tracking meditation, you can sign up for my newsletter. And um, I also have a YouTube channel, which is Rebecca Tolan Mind Body and Life Coaching. So I do some recovery stories and also just some practices. And I, and I house a lot of other books on the website from people in this field, books and videos, so people can just find the approach that resonates with them. I also um, am teaching a 10-week course on how to recover from chronic fatigue and pain called Be Your Own Medicine. And I'm really excited because I've been um, reworking that for a year and I'm going to open that this fall. Um, and so you can find out that on the website as well. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.